The first six months of 2022 has ended. The S&P 500 index has lost 21% of its value. That is $8 trillion in six months and $13 trillion globally has evaporated. I can't even fathom a trillion, but eight trillion and 13 trillion. The NASDAQ 100 has lost 30% of its value, and the 20-year government treasury bond ETF lost 21% of its value. And that's the most shocking. That's not supposed to happen. Bonds are supposed to provide some kind of relief or protection against equity risk, and that did not happen. Let me put this in perspective. This is the worst first six months of a year in stocks for the last 50 years. That goes back to when Richard Nixon was president. U.S. bonds have only once in the history of our country dropped this much in the first six months of a year. The only time worse than 2022 was in 1788, the year the U.S. Constitution was ratified. Wow. Think about that. Traditional financial advisors are at a loss for what to do. Their typical 60-40 stock and bond portfolios have collapsed. I talked to their clients. They are angry. Some told their advisors to do something, anything, to stop the bleeding. Every person I have talked to told me that their advisors blew them off and told them to just hang on. Some even told their clients, I'm the financial advisor, not you, and I'm doing what is in your best interest. Really? Shocking. Most have been trying to spin this as a minor correction that would soon bounce back to new highs. Following these conversations, people reported to me that their portfolios continued to collapse. That's sad. People are beside themselves and not knowing what to do, and their advisors certainly don't. I'm Ben Rupond. Today is July 5th, 2022. Welcome to my YouTube broadcast. I saw a couple of articles in Bloomberg one of them by uh, pointing out Bob Michelle, who is the um, uh, leading person uh, analyst in uh, JP Morgan. And he said he warns of a recession as the brutal first half draws to an end. Well, that makes a nice headline and they get to put the name JP Morgan in there and the word recession, but this is not exactly forecasting anything. Uh, the first quarter was negative, contraction. The second quarter has come to a close. <laughs> it's apparent to most of us, maybe we're right, that it's going to be negative as well. It seems like it will be. So to make a prediction at the end of the second quarter that we're probably going to be in a recession is not exactly stepping out on a limb. But um, anyway, it made interesting news. It is more newsworthy, in my opinion, to show you the next article where they point out that Michael Burry thinks that we may be about halfway through the market fall. So what he's saying is he is stepping out on a limb as he's inclined to do, and his track record speaks for itself. And he is saying that however far down the market has come, it's got that much more to fall before the fall is over. I have read this from numerous sources and I tend to believe this. Uh, we don't know for sure, 
But last week, I played a clip, a one-minute clip, and I'm going to replay it because it's only one minute, and it makes this point. It's from Danny Berger from Bloomberg, and she points out with her 150 years of research that they, Bloomberg, believe based on that, that the market is about halfway through the decline that will it will eventually go through. So I'll play that clip for you. The S&P 500 index may have another 24% to fall by year end. That's according to SockGen, based on the past 150 years of financial market history, they say. Bloomberg's Danny Berger has been pouring over the details. Danny. Yeah, Anna, this comes from the quant team, and you know I love me some quants. It's an interesting uh, argument and, and thesis to hear, especially today on a day when stocks are rallying, perhaps due to the concern about the economy and what that means for the Fed. But basically, looking at this wide set of data, they argue that from the peaks, the fair valuation of when we enter into a crisis period and come out of it is far lower than where we are now. In, indeed, they say that from the January peak, we needed to fall about 40%. In percentage point terms, we're about halfway there. So it's not necessarily about valuations of this market. It's based on past crises valuations as well. And look, part of the conversation is perhaps we haven't fully capitulated. And that's why we're not as low as where SockGen thinks we will be. Perhaps we'll get there. There are signs of pessimism. For example, Bank of America America says that through Wednesday, there were outflows from equity funds the most in nine weeks. So there certainly are concerns there. But again, that came before markets started to rebound. So how much further do they need to go to fit in the opinion of SockGen that, that sort of post-crisis valuation? I will contrast the U.S. economy and how we solve hard problems with those of ancient Egypt. I will first begin with Egypt. The following description is the best way to illustrate how hard decisions were made in Egypt to solve economic and financial problems. One night, the king of Egypt had a dream, actually two dreams that he could not understand. He sent for a young Hebrew slave in prison who was known to be able to interpret complex dreams. He summoned this young man named Joseph. Joseph was not only a prisoner, but a foreigner who spoke with a foreign accent and had a foreign religion. The king explained the dream to Joseph this way. I was standing beside the Nile River and out of the river came seven healthy fat cows. Then out of the river came seven lean, sickly looking cows. The seven lean cows ate the seven healthy cows. The second dream was like it. There were seven healthy leaves of grain and they were devoured by seven shriveled up leaves of grain. Joseph explained that he could not interpret the dream, but only God could. But he, Joseph, was willing to tell the king the meaning of the interpretation. I think the king probably said, okay, tell me what all this means. Joseph said that this means there will be seven years of prosperity in the land of Egypt, and those seven years will be followed by seven years of famine. To survive the seven years of famine, the people of Egypt would have to tighten their belts for the first seven years and live off 80% of what they produced and save, save the remaining 20%. The king decided to not only put Joseph in charge of this operation, but gave him authority to make all decisions on behalf of the king and the country of Egypt. He gave Joseph his signet ring that allowed him to sign any decree as if it were being signed by the king himself. Joseph carried out the plan. He likely told the people to also save up their money during the first seven years because they would need it to be able to survive the seven lean years. So the government and the people were in a conservation mode under Joseph's leadership. During the seven lean years, there was a provision for those who did not have enough money to buy food. They could sell their cattle, their land, and even work for the government to have food to eat and not starve. In such a case, the government would take 20% of what they produced on government land 
and the worker would keep 80%. I think of it as kind of like sharecropping. There was no borrowing of money, there was no printing of money, and there were no handouts. Everyone paid their way, even the government. This plan allowed for the preservation of the Egyptian empire that lasted another 1,200 years and preserved the foundation that eventually became the nation of Israel. Think about that. The nation of Egypt and the nation of Israel pivoted on this conversation. Contrast this with how we, the United States, handle challenging problems today. Let's first begin with a view of the problems we're facing. The reason I bring this up is because I believe we need some kind of hope in order for our economy and even the stock and bond markets to rise again. I further believe that any plan short of a solid and long-lasting plan will eventually fail and result in a series of collapses. And this could even go over several years. Then we will be able to rebuild a more lasting economy. In other words, we need some kind of light at the end of the tunnel. And there doesn't appear to be any today. I made a list of the problems that I believe have contributed to our decline and that must be addressed for us to grow out of this mess. So bear with me while I go through this. We, the country, actually the Federal Reserve, have decimated the buying power of our currency caused by out of control inflation. This means that wages are not keeping up with the cost of goods and services. Rapidly rising interest rates that are spilling over into high interest rate mortgages. You, the U.S. debt is over 30 trillion and climbing at 1.7 trillion this year. If we use the interest rate of the 10-year Treasury note, this means that we are paying about $900 billion in interest alone, with no plans to pay back any of the principal or even the interest. There is $9 trillion of excess printed money on the Fed's balance sheet with nothing behind it. Just pure paper, or actually just digits, electronic digits. $9 trillion of electronic digits. Food shortages and food prices are continuing to rise. Gas prices are crazy high. Real estate is out of reach for many potential home buyers. Supply chain issues are showing up in almost everything we buy. The stock market is collapsing. The bond market is collapsing. The financial advisory industry that I'm a part of has been completely ineffective in dealing with declining portfolios. Anyone can get a handout if they want one. There is becoming less and less incentive for people to work. In my area, I see restaurants closing because they can't get workers who want to work. Crime and violence are everywhere, especially in the cities. We live in an upside down world where right is wrong and wrong is right. It seems like everywhere you turn, no one is telling the truth about anything. I wonder how Joseph and the ancient Egyptians would have tackled these problems. As I said, unless we develop a plan to deal with these problems, at least some of them, we will be relegated to the long list of countries and empires that no longer exist. Yes, the, the land will still be there and some people will still be there, but the prosperity, the culture and lifestyle of the people, and even the currency will be gone. What were once great nations have actually disappeared. Governments all over the world 
<clears throat> not just the U.S., are existing and thriving on credit. Paper money with nothing behind it. And that's credit. Worthless paper, which can be easily destroyed or changed so that it becomes worth nothing. Those in charge of the global monetary system know this. We are like pawns and are powerless to change what is happening. However, we can take small steps to help protect ourselves as all of this unfolds. <clears throat> I don't want to live in a world that is based on fear and destruction. I want to be optimistic and hopeful that our reality will be better in the future <clears throat> than it is today. Each week, I will cover some aspect of what is happening and what we can do, even if it is in incremental steps. I talked about, <laughs> this really was amazing to me, I talked about the idea that bonds have experienced their worst six months of performance or huge decline since 1788. And this was confirmed by the article about where Deutsche Bank reported this uh, via Bloomberg. Bloomberg. And you can see I put the arrow at the far right, which will show the graphically, show the decline of bonds this year and an arrow on the left side, which shows the decline of bonds in 1788 the year that the U.S. Constitution was ratified. I have no idea, other than the Constitution, I have no idea what happened that year that saw, caused such an incredible collapse of bonds, but that happened. There are a wreck, and this has been continuing for the last few years, there continues to be a record number of CEO resignations. Now, I find this interesting because the, okay, I was a CEO, I founded a company, was the CEO of a company for many years, and so I understand the uh, CEO uh, dilemma and what goes on in the corner office. And the, as I looked at the reasons they listed here, I thought, this is ridiculous. This is ridiculous. These are phony reasons. I don't know what the real reasons are, but I would bet 90% of, of these aren't the real reason. Uh, stepped down, retired, no reason given, interim period over, resigned, whatever. Those aren't the reasons. I remember when I sold my company, I had, uh, we had a public relations firm that you know put out a press release and this sort of thing. And they, they wrote, and of course in there, a quote from me, of course, they wrote it, a quote from me that said uh, the reason we're selling. And of course, a quote from the CEO of the company we sold to and the reason they're buying and so forth. And it was all whitewashed. It was all just fluff. It was, I didn't say that. I didn't even think that. And they were just putting spin on it. If I were to write it, I would say the reason I'm selling is to get my money out of the company. I'm tired. I'm burned out. I'm you know, I need to move on. It was a good company. It was a good experience. I'm glad I did it. But, you know, I'm burned out. You know, that was the real reason. They don't put that stuff. That's not a reason. So I think 90% of the reasons, these people are the highest paid people in their company, probably the most prestigious position in their company. And they're resigning. They're quitting. They're being fired, whatever. It just seems weird to me. Maybe they got a whole pile of money. Maybe they, um, you know, I, I have no idea. Maybe they messed up. I, I don't know what it is. But the, the, for the top guy, the guy that's making the most money to quit, it just doesn't sound right to me. This kind of said the same thing. It was an article in Barron's Insiders. Okay, and these are probably CEOs, but CFOs and others. Insiders are selling more stocks than they are buying. And then they go on to talk about the exception. A, a lot of insiders are selling. But the financial advising industry, the traditional industry, is telling you to buy. So it's interesting. The CEOs are quitting, 
More people are selling than buying, and you're being told to buy. That also doesn't sound right to me. I appreciate it when people write comments on the videos. Thank you for those of you that do. I try to respond to most of them, and even just to say thank you. The One of the comments was from um, a lady, and she said, uh, would you please cover um, information about how we can learn about how our bank or credit union is, is rated? How strong are they financially? I thought, now that, I've done some research on this before, so I dug in and got some material, and I want to share it with you so that you can uh, look at the rating of your bank or any bank you're considering. Uh, and then I'll give you a personal comment uh, for you know, myself. The company is a company I've known about for decades, a company called Weiss Ratings, W-E-I-S-S, -S, the upper left yellow box, WeissRatings.com. And when you go to that, there will be a bar at the top and you click on the tab banking and then there is a search bar above and you type in the name of your bank and it will pull up the rating and financial metrics like uh, troubled loan, and, you know, assets, liabilities, etc. but troubled loans and the amount of assets that are set aside to cover those loans. And from that they, and other factors, they derive a rating. And, you know, A plus, A, A minus, B, and so forth. And the, um, it pretty, pretty inf it, it's actual, it's uh, factual and I think informative. Now, I'll go on to say that when I looked up my bank, my bank does not have an A-plus rating. And it, the reason, and, and that's okay with me, I wish they did, but they don't, uh, but I don't keep a lot of money in the bank. So I uh, keep my money in TD Ameritrade and in my life insurance policy and in physical cash. And so the, it is not, if, if the bank went out of business today, it would not be a big loss to me. But, you know, that's... But I, I, I like the bank, I prefer the bank because they have a practice that I like. They, when I go to the bank to take out money, physical cash, they do not ask me why. I don't, as long as it's under 10,000 per day, I do not have to sign for it. And there are some banks that want to know why you're taking out the bank. I've literally had this happen, that want to know why you're withdrawing the money. It's none of their business. It's your money. And they say they, they have to report it. They don't have to report it. Why does one bank not report that and another bank does? So I, I, I don't know what reason they use, but it's none of their business. So that's why I like the bank I work with, because they um, don't ask those intrusive questions. And, um, th and they give it to me, I, I want it in 20s. They go, okay, give me just a few minutes. And they go and they get it, hand it to me. That's the end of it. I like that. So there are other factors, and of course there's relationships, but there are other factors other than um, ratings. But you have to factor all of that in. But this is a tool if you want to check out how your bank is rated or other banks are rated. The, <coughs> excuse me, the manufacturing index is known as a leading indicator for the economy. And, you know, whether it's going up or down, it's a, considered to be a leading indicator. The Richmond Fed uh, manufacturing composite index is this chart. And you can see where it is to the far right. It has been in a period of decline for sometime. I don't know the length of time. Maybe that's a year. But it has been in a period of decline as continuing to decline. And that is a, uh, that uh, foreshadows, I think, the future of the economy, which uh, is negative. I'll cover more of that later. Now I'm going to get into the uh, dashboard and the stock market indicators and some charts that um, hopefully will be helpful. Uh, this is as of Friday, July 1st. Um, this shows the uh, Dow Jones Industrials, the S&P 500, 
the uh, uh, NASDAQ 100, the Treasury, uh, long-term Treasury bond, ETF, TLT, et cetera. So I'll go through these kind of starting from the best performing or, or the one that has lost the least money, I guess you'd say, to the one that has lost the most money. So the Dow Jones Industrials uh, lost 14% year to date as of um, Friday. Uh, S&P 500 down 17 or 19, almost 20%. And the long-term government bond, TLT, down 21%, supposed to give us protection. QQQ, which is the NASDAQ 100, uh, down uh, 29%. The uh, technology component of the NASDAQ 100, down 34%. The ARC K Innovation Fund, down 56%, and Netflix, I put that in there just for drill, down 70%. A lot of tech stocks have been hit very, very hard, including Netflix. The, this is a dashboard of um, stocks, or of indexes, um, US, foreign, uh, and some asset classes and so forth. Just a mixture, but this doesn't, I wanna focus on the moving averages. So as a stock or an index goes up and down, it you know does this, but with that comes a moving average, a smoothing of that, so that you can see that either the index is above its moving average or below its moving average. When it's below its moving average, it is generally bearish or negative um, indicator. When it is above, moving up above its moving average, it is a pos generally a positive indicator. So these red dots to the far right, they could be red or green, they're all red. Interesting, no surprise. These indicate the 20, 50, 100, and 200 day moving averages of each of these. All of these indexes are below their moving averages. Even though Friday was a positive day in the stock market, generally speaking, it is still negative in every category. GLD, gold, Dow Jones Industrials, silver, emerging markets, S&P 500, developed markets, foreign markets, EFA, IWM, the Russell 2000 Small Cap Index, QQQ, the NASDAQ 100, um, and again, I put my uh, favorite um, stock on here, Netflix, and Coinbase. All negative, all below, all moving averages. Very interesting. It, it, this is a rare picture. I don't know that we'll see this very often. When I take the S&P 500, you take it apart and look at the component parts. These are sectors inside of the S&P 500. These are all part of the S&P 500. But these sectors all move kind of differently. So I applied the same test to all 11 sectors and there are five green dots. That's great, five green dots. There was one last week. so. Uh, energy is above its 200-day moving average. Uh, consumer staples, above its 20-day moving average. Healthcare, above its 20 and 50-day moving average. And uh, IYR, the real estate uh, index, is above its 20-day moving average. All others, on all averages, are negative. No surprise, because the S&P 500 itself is negative on all four indexes, or all four moving averages. Okay, now we'll jump over to charts to give you a visual picture of what's happening. The, this is the S&P 500, the exchange traded fund SPY, SPY, and it is a 12 month chart, weekly chart, show, so one move equals one week, and over the past year, at, going through last Friday, uh, July 1st the approximately the first six months or the first six months of that 12 months was generally positive 
and above its 20 period moving average. The, during the past six months, through you can tell from the data we just showed, generally the S&P 500 is in a downward direction. It may go up temporarily, but the long-term direction or intermediate term direction probably is in a downward direction. It has not broken the trend line and it's moving south. It at some point will turn and go back up and we'll start to confirm the fact that it's moving up, but we're not at that point right now. Does not look good for the future. The S&P 500 has two kinds of stocks in it. They have, it has growth stocks and it has value stocks. Growth stocks are companies like um, Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, etc. Uh, those are growth companies. They, that for the you know, first or 12 month period, probably the first 10 months, nine or 10 months of last year was positive, moving in an upward direction. Then from the top of the black arrow, you can see it's going down and the, this shows, this is a relative chart, so it shows that when it goes down, that value is in favor instead of growth. Growth is in favor during the first part of the chart. Value is in favor. Value type stocks are in favor during the uh, last part of the chart. And those companies that value companies would be companies like um, you know, healthcare companies like Johnson & Johnson or uh, Ford Motor Company or Boeing, companies like that. When we do a comparison or a ratio chart, do another one on the S&P 500 compared to the Russell 2000. Actually, the Russell 2000 small cap index would be the numerator in this case, and the S&P 500 would be the denominator. So if it is moving up, that would say that small cap stocks are outperforming uh, large cap stocks, which would be the S&P 500. If it's moving down, it shows that um, the S&P 500 is outperforming small cap, or it may not be outperforming in a positive way. It may be going down. They may both be going down, which they are, but the S&P 500 would be going down at a slower rate Said another way, the Russell 2000 would be going down at a faster rate relative to each other. This is not a relative chart. This is just a pure chart of the 20 year government, long term government bond. And I stretched it out over two years so that you could see not just the 12 month period, but an entire 24 month period. And as, you've, as I've talked about, the government bond has been in deep decline this year, but it even started last year. So you can see the decline of the um, uh, TLT, the long-term government bond, actually during 2020 and in part of 2021, represented by the red arrow. And then beginning in late 2021, through present, you can see the black arrow, clearly a downward direction and um, not providing any relief for stocks in a 60-40 or balanced portfolio. This is a picture of GLD, which is gold, the ETF for gold. And it, I show it because in this chart, it's basically just going up and down. It's been going up and down for a while. It is not really trending in any particular direction. Short term, it's going down, but you know, over the 24 month period, just a lot of up and down. And silver represented by SLV is a little bit more for the last year or so, a little more in a downward direction. It also goes up and down but he's pushing down more than uh, gold is. When I compare the two on a relativity chart, uh, making silver, <coughs> SLV, the numerator, and GLD, the denominator, uh, it is favoring GLD for the last, what, 15, 16 months. 
And so a downward direction favors gold, an upward direction would favor silver. The volatility index through Friday, as a weekly chart looking for the last 12 months, pure volatility, the index, the uh, ticker is uh, VIX, which is for the volatility index. And it goes up and down a lot. It is still above its, uh, the, the arbitrary number of 24, showing the volatility is still relatively high, uh, meaning uh, stocks, generally speaking, are uh, still pushing downward. I thought I would put Bitcoin in here. I definitely have people who comment on my um, illustrating of Bitcoin. Uh, but this is just, it is what it is. Uh, Bitcoin uh, has been in a downward direction um, and is down 70% or so for um, since uh, the top of this, which was in um, uh, November of last year. So um, Bitcoin is now, uh, as of Friday, was down about uh, to 19,000 from its high of 65,000. That is a huge drop. And at 65,000, people we're talking about, it's going to 100,000 or 200,000. It's down at 19. And I know there are people who are enthusiastic about Bitcoin. It may have some future value, but it is incredibly volatile and it is incredibly correlated with equities, which uh, does not provide any relief um, against equities, any protection. Uh, as equities are in a declining mode. Okay, I'll jump over to Asbury Research, and they have, as of Friday, they have uh, six indicators uh, that they follow in the Asbury Six metrics, and two of those are positive, four of those are negative, which in their view is still a bearish uh, condition, uh, generally speaking. The cross-asset uh, relative performance uh, comparison uh, shows the which one is performing the best, comparing this versus that. So, for example, U.S. stocks versus bonds. <laughs> as bad as bonds are, <laughs> they're actually, for the last three months, have actually, the last week, the last month, and the last three months, which is the three periods they're measuring, um, bonds have actually done better than stocks. Uh, low volatility type stocks are doing better than high volatility or high beta stocks. Uh, large cap is doing better than small cap. Both are declining, but large cap is declining less. S&P 500 is lagging the Dow. The Dow Jones Industrial Average is outperforming the S&P, and the S&P in the next line is outperforming the NASDAQ 100 in all three categories last quarter, last month, last week, or I should say the reverse of that, weekly, monthly, quarterly. Uh, and then the U.S. versus developed markets, meaning mostly Japan and Asia, or Japan and uh, Europe and Australia, uh, the U.S. is outperforming. And the next category where all three are in the green zone is corporate bonds, are outperforming high yield. High yield bonds have had a very rough time um, correlated with equities. And um, so that gives you the cross asset uh, relative performance. And then when we look at the world, all of these countries, I think there are 21 of them and some regions of the world, there are three countries that are outperforming the US notably enough so that they get a green um, bar, uh, and that is Hong Kong, China, and Russia. The U.S. is outperforming in some cases, but barely, not enough to get a green bar. And then I thought I would just take one of those, there's only three, you know, Hong Kong, China, Russia. I took one of those to just show you what that looks like. So I did this on a relativity chart for the last year to show the relative performance, uh, in this case, Hong Kong versus the U.S. So uh, the U.S., being the denominator, was uh, outperforming for the first six months or so 
And since January, while they have both been down, since January, Hong Kong is down less than the U.S., which means the trend line on a relative performance basis is increasing. Gold and silver as of Friday, uh, gold is uh, 18.12 per ounce and silver 19.90 per ounce. Both of them are down and silver is down quite a bit. Uh, gold is minus eight tenths of 1% and silver is down 6% for one week. Uh, I've told you before that I do not look at um, silver at, or gold as an investment. I look at them as an insurance policy. So any decline in value does not phase me at all. If anything, it might be a motivation for me to buy more, but I'm going to hold it for the long run and hope that I never have to use it to barter with. Good thing we're in first class. Uh, Chairman Powell has been talking about a soft landing. Good luck. Uh, no one agrees with that. It's interesting, these Fed chairmen like Powell, but all the others before him, uh, always try to put a spin on how things are basically okay until they leave office. <laughs> and then when they leave office, they start telling the truth. And uh, it's interesting to get quotes from former Fed chairman and how honest they are and how, uh, I guess, whitewashing they were when they were in office. So interesting. I think this actually tells the real story. Thank you for watching. If you have comments, leave them in the comment section below. If you want to reach out and have a conversation, I'd be glad to talk to you. Thank you. A number of people have. I enjoy those conversations. So thank you again for watching.